what would you like me to tell you? Or what would you like me to say at this point? It was brutal, but that's normal. It was, it's, it's parent teacher conferences. Yeah, I literally like booked it out of work to get here. To the Vancouver Public Library. Thank you for coming out on such a dark and stormy night. My name is Raji Manga. I'm proud to serve as a trustee to the Vancouver Public Library Board. I'd like to begin the evening by acknowledging that we are gathered on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And we thank the people of these nations for their hospitality. Tonight, we're delighted to host the inaugural Paul and Eileen Lin Commemorative Lecture in partnership with the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of BC. For this special event, historian Timothy J. Stanley will speak about the importance of naming and contesting white supremacy. We are glad that you're able to join us this evening. Before we begin, um, I'd like to just let you know about an upcoming event. On Monday, November 27th at 7 p.m., Karis Craig, the author of Dead Reckoning, will be in conversation with writer Wade Compton to discuss Canada's criminal justice system. She will share her experience meeting her father's killer and what she hopes the future will hold for offenders and victims of crime. More information about that event and other events here at VPL can be found at the information table just over here to my right um, and also on our website at vpl.ca slash events. Please take a moment to mute your phone um, and please use the back doors if you need to exit uh, at any point during the evening. So to begin, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Price from the University of Victoria's Depart Department of History. John is a board member with the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of BC and has been part of the founding group established to honor the legacy of Paul and Eileen Lin. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. John Price. Thank you very much, Raji, for that warm welcome and introduction, and uh, welcome to you all. Having braved the deluge, uh, you deserve medals and uh, congratulations uh, for making it out to uh, an evening uh, when uh, the inclement weather was really a challenge. I too would like to offer uh, the, an acknowledgement of the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations uh, as we go through a process of reckoning with the past, uh, I think it's becoming obvious for so many of us, including myself, whose ancestors took Kwantlen land uh, up in Langley over 100 years ago, uh, that there's much work to do uh, in uh, both returning the land and seeking reconciliation with First Nations. So as Raji said, I teach at the University of Victoria. Um, and uh, tonight's lecture is the inaugural uh, 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 Paul and Eileen Lynn commemorative lecture. Uh, and before we begin the lecture, I would like to take a few minutes to explain why we felt it important to honor Paul and Eileen Lynn. I began, just going to. I began my studies at UBC. Uh, almost 50 years ago, it's hard to believe, but uh, at the time we created what was known as the East Asian Studies Association, a Students Association. And I distinctly remember going to a retreat down in Point Roberts, where we got together uh, with other students uh, who were in Asian studies uh, uh, to talk about various um, issues that we were looking at. And many of the students who were studying uh, China or studying Chinese were complaining and saying, um, you know, how difficult it was to learn Chinese. And uh, having just returned myself from a two-year stint in Japan, uh, and being rather full of myself, as 20-year-old 20 20 -old students can tend to be, um, I piped up and said, well, why don't you just go to China and learn the language there? One of the 
China students uh, looked at me and patiently explained that there was no way to get to China, that Canada had no diplomatic relations, and there were no student exchanges. I had been put in my place. The lack of diplomatic relations with China was about much more than just students not being able to visit. The British government had recognized the People's Republic of China in 1950, but the Canadian government had towed the US line and refused to recognize China. It made travel between the two countries extremely difficult. And for Chinese Canadians, it complicated family reunification programs, the only way for Chinese to come to Canada at the time. The lack of diplomatic relations also gave the Canadian government another excuse to continue its policy of excluding Chinese immigration. The establishment of uh, diplomatic relations and normalization of relations between Canada and the People's Republic took place on October 13, 1970 and was due in no small measure to the work of Paul and Eileen Lin. After returning to China, uh, to Canada from China in 1964, they campaigned tirelessly to stop the demonization of China and to normalize relations. As the director of McGill's Center for East Asian Studies, Paul worked closely with advocates of normalization and during the 1968 election, federal election campaign, he wrote a feature piece in the Globe and Mail in which he said, if Canada really wants to begin fruitful relations with the PRC, the only path is the recognition of Peking as the successor government of China through normal diplomatic procedures with no strings attached as other governments have done. This brought him to the attention of policy, liberal policymakers and with the election of Pierre Trudeau in 1968, a change was in the wind. Ivan Head, senior policy advisor to Trudeau, was constantly consulting Paul. This, however, became a political issue in the House of Commons, where former Prime Minister John Diefenbaker taunted Trudeau, suggesting that Paul, Hin, Paul Lin, his Canadian-born Chinese friend who visited Red China, was going to be appoint, appointed ambassador. Trudeau hotly and perhaps somewhat disingenuously denied knowing Paul. In their book, Eye of the China Storm, Eileen recalled later how Paul and Trudeau had finally met. I alerted Paul to who was behind him. He instantly turned to face Trudeau. With neither arrogance nor deference, he introduced himself. Mr. Trudeau, my name is Paul Lin. The Prime Minister was taken by surprise, blushed and blurted out, Diefen Baker was taunting me. <laughs> Paul replied with a smile, well, now you cannot deny that you have met me. Paul and Eileen's work would play a significant role, not only in uh, achieving diplomatic recognition and normalization of relations with China, it was also significant in the US decision to recognize China a few years later. The reestablishment of diplomatic relations and the changes in immigration Changes fought for and achieved by many Asian Canadians and their allies opened up a new era in China-Canada relations. Whatever issues exist today in China-Canada relations, and there are many, we should not underestimate the importance of re-establishing diplomatic relations in 1970, and nor should we forget the important role of Paul and Eileen Lin. This powerful team came together during World War II at the University of Michigan. Eileen, then Eileen Chen was an exchange student from Shanghai. Her family uh, was also from, Hang, uh, from Shanghai and this photo uh, from 1937 uh, captures the family. Uh, Paul was born in Vancouver and grew up in Vernon. His father came to Canada as a laborer in 1897 and went on to become the first Anglican minister of Chinese heritage. His mother raised a family of five. In high school, Paul gained the reputation as a brilliant orator and he lent his penmanship and his eloquence to the cause of China, China's liberation from Japan's imperial war. He was a student activist, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, first in Canada and then in the US. 
He had chosen to study at the University of Michigan because he yearned for contact with students from China and wanted to improve his Chinese. There he met Eileen, who taught him Chinese and a lot more. The couple fell in love and married on June 24, 1944, the same day that Eileen graduated from the University of Michigan. Their two children, Christopher and Douglas, were born soon after. But abandoning doctoral studies at Harvard in 1949, Paul with Eileen and the two children moved to China to work, hoping to help transform China into an egalitarian and progressive country. It was not easy, and after 15 years in China, they thought it was time to go. Eileen and Paul were close to Sung Ching Ling, the widow of Sun Yat-sen, who was an icon in China at this time. And when Paul told her that they felt it was time to go and return to Canada, Sung Ching Ling made it happen, despite the Cultural Revolution brewing at that time. In many ways, however, it was out of the frying pan into the fire. Canadian immigration refused to admit Eileen and the children for over six months. The province newspaper launched a red-baiting campaign against Paul when they learned that UBC was considering hiring him. Fortunately, McGill offered Paul the job as founding director of the Centre for East Asian Studies. His eloquence and passion attracted many to his classes, including myself and including Tim Stanley who will be talking tonight. To be sure, idealism was rampant, but Paul's approach to China was very pragmatic. And throughout his life, he de demonstrated this pragmatism. And in 1989, when the travesty of Tiananmen occurred, Paul did not hesitate to speak out. By then, he and Eileen had returned to settle in Vancouver and after a stint at the University of East, after a stint at the University of East Asia. A major activity for Eileen and Paul in those days was founding and building the Sung Ching Ling Children's Foundation of Canada. For his efforts in 1998, Paul received the Order of Canada, and today we honor both Eileen and Paul, who ever mindful of their Chinese heritage, have been devoted to bringing people together in the cause of justice and international friendship. We're very honored that Eileen has been able to join us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Eileen Chen Lin. Say something now. Yeah. Oh, okay. This this was after the. There you go. After the, just a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'm really honored to come and attend the opening of the uh, commemorative lectures. Not necessarily. I, I was surprised it was in our name today, but not every time. Okay. Just. Uh, <laughs> just yeah. And. Um, uh, I, I think it's a good idea to have the commentary that is, and I'll take this opportunity to uh, thank John Price and your friends and your colleagues that helped you to get this thing going. And I think that we will learn a lot from these lectures. Um, this evening, for example, I understand the academic focus of our speaker this evening, um, Professor Tim Stanley, is on both history and education. I think I appreciate this very much. I think these are two absolute essentials for building a new China. 
um, China not only can use these two basic philosophies to become prosperous and strong, but also democratic, where people can express their feelings. So I think we're going to have a very good lecture today. Okay, that's all I want to say. Go sit down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this is mine or yours. That's mine. You. I have to be careful. Let me not fall down in front of everybody else. Me too. Thank you very much, Eileen, for sharing those thoughts. Uh, it's now my uh, honor to invite the president of the Chinese Canadian Historical Society, John Atkin, uh, to come and uh, make a, a few announcements and to introduce our speaker this evening, John. Good evening. Um, it is indeed an absolute pleasure to be here and to be part of our inaugural uh, lecture. This is something the Society's been working on for a while, and uh, it's been really great fun uh, sitting at board meetings thinking about what are we going to talk, who is our first guest, how are we going to structure this, and I think uh, having uh, Tim uh, Stanley speak tonight uh, is perfect because we're right in the middle of a really interesting debate. Uh, the illustration that opened uh, that was sitting up here when you came in, Siwash Rock, we're very pleased. I think that the Parks Board passed their motion that finally, after a hundred years or so of complaining, that they'll actually put back the Squamish and or Musqueam name on uh, Siwash Rock. Uh, and we're in a debate and discussion around in the city of Vancouver. I have the privilege and extreme honor of being on the Civic Asset Naming Committee. That's a very grand name for something that names streets and sewage pumping stations. Um, we have 11 of them if you know someone that you want to commemorate. <laughs> no, we've only managed to name one. Anyway, uh, we name streets, we name assets, par uh, not parks, not schools, but um, other civic owned assets. And so our mandate from 2012 when the committee was established is diversity and the, the city as it is today, not about a historical look and just trying to find you know, those dead white guys to stick on a street. And so we work very hard at that, and the committee members work very hard at thinking about the city in a very different way. And we have also Andrea Reimer, Councillor Andrea Reimer's motion around uh, naming and the slight possibility of renaming. And so that's working its way through uh, various processes, and our committee has started working on a naming policy because while there's certain things that guide the city in its naming, there's no concrete naming policy. We have a mandate for the committee and there are certain guidelines, but we felt instead of trying to write a renaming policy, which we're writing, but we'd fold it into a naming policy. And then that way there's some concrete guidelines of how we name things. Having said that though, uh, we are very pleased uh, to announce that on next Tuesday, the 28th, there's a report going to council where the largest number of women ever in the city's history will finally get street names. We are naming all of the lanes in the West End are streets. They're 33 feet wide. New development is happening on those lanes and as soon as something gets approved, you need an address. You can't have an address unless you have a street. And so most of the lanes in the West End will have women who are very strongly connected to the West End added to the street names. We've also brought in um, three aid activists. Uh, we have Ted North, for instance, and the lane, we're very pleased with this one, behind the Dr. Peter Center. Uh, the committee was asked in just sort of a rhetorical thing, who was Dr. Peter? And everyone sat there and went, uh, what was his last name? So now you'll be able to stand at the lane behind the Dr. Peter Center and phone a cab 
and actually say, I'm at the Dr. Peter Center on Jepson Young Lane. And so his full name will be out there in the public realm. And we have a couple of other interesting names as well, including, for the first time in the city's history, a Chinese-Canadian name, including, it's a woman, Vivian Zhang, who we're naming the lane between Harwood and Beach because she broke the color bar at the Crystal Pool, and she was Vancouver's first Chinese-Canadian school teacher. And so we were able to uh, find a space because we've moved the city of Vancouver's first elected woman councillor, Helena Gutteridge, to the new plaza at City Hall, which used to be the East Wing. When they tore that down, they left the parking garage up, and there's a new plaza that's there. So that's Helena Gutteridge Plaza. And so we were able to put Vivian Jung on the lane between Harwood and Beach. And so our work is really about bringing that diversity to the streets, to the civic assets, etc. And so we work very hard at that. But there's always those questions. We always get that note from the public. Where are the indigenous names? Why aren't you naming streets after, etc.? And it's not so easy because when you talk to uh, Larry Grant at uh, Musqueam, he says, well, we didn't have streets. So the concept of naming a street, we wouldn't know how to name one of those. But there are ge geographic features that have names that have been erased. How do you bring those back? How do you bring them back in a proper way? Uh, McDonald School just got its indigenous name. So the McDonald name goes away. Uh, the school board's talking about maybe dumping that awful name for Crosstown School and bringing something much more appropriate. And so there is those opportunities to bring these names back out into the landscape and into common use. And so I'm very pleased to be able to be part of that with the Civic Assets Naming Committee, which then makes tonight's lecture uh, even more fun for myself and members of the committee. And I think it opens up that very important discussion around the city of Vancouver and that larger context of where we are, what we inhabit, what is there, and the various layers that we need to bring uh, to the surface. So I get to introduce Tim. And it is my honor, in fact, to uh, introduce Professor Timothy J. Stanley. Uh, Tim attended uh, McGill University and was one of Paul Lynn's students in the 1970s. Uh, as, uh, John mentioned he went to China on an exchange program after graduating. Uh, oh, no, not that was the other guy. Um, anyway, Tim went to China on an exchange program after graduating in 1975, did his graduate work at UBC where he obtained his doctorate in 1991. Uh, his research focus has been on Chinese Canadian history and anti racism education. Uh, his landmark uh, works include his noted article, Chinamen Wherever We Go, Chinese Nationalism and Guangdong Merchants in British Columbia, 1871 to 1911, uh, published in the Canadian Historical Review, uh, and his book, Contesting White Supremacy, and that was from uh, UBC Press in 2012, is a close examination of the Chinese student strike against segregation in Victoria in 1922. And uh, his book won the Founders Prize from the Canadian History of Edu Education Association and the Clio Prize from the Canadian Historical Association. Uh, he is a tenured professor at the University of Ottawa, where he currently is the interim director of the Institute of Canadian and Aboriginal Studies. His previous positions included interim dean and vice dean of the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. And Tim has been an education or educator activist all his life. He uh, was directly involved in the early 1980s fight against the racist CV CTV program Campus Giveaway and worked to establish the anti-racist organization, uh, the BCOFR, the BC Organization to Fight Racism. And more recently, he has spearheaded the, uh, I think, much needed criticism of uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, Canada's first prime minister, for his genocidal and racist views. And he's on the advisory committee for the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa. So tonight, uh, his topic is, what is in a name? So please uh, join me in a very warm welcome to Professor Tim Stanley. This one on. Lift that one on. Just leave that sitting there. That there. Well, that's quite a quite an introduction. Um, I too want to begin tonight by acknowledging this as the traditional and unceded territory of the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, and these peoples are the guardians of this territory, past, present, and future, and I'd like to thank them for allowing us to use it today. 
And I make this acknowledgement not only for reasons of political correctness or even what might pass as common courtesy these days, uh, but rather because without such acknowledgement, it's easy to forget that we live at the tail end of a history of racism, exclusion, and colonization that in many ways continues into the present. It also means that there may be amongst us people who have very different connections to this particular place in which we're in tonight. For someone like myself, this is a, 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 a connection of a matter of a few hours, and for others, it's one that goes back as long as human memory goes back anywhere in the world, in fact, in effect, to the beginning of time. And that we need to remind ourselves of this through such an acknowledgement is in many ways the point of my talk tonight. I also wanted to say what an honor and a privilege it is to be here tonight uh, giving the uh, 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 Paul and Eileen Lynn Memorial Lecture, uh, which is under the uh, vestiges not only of the Vancouver uh, Public Library, but of the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of BC. Now, it just so happens, I believe I'm the most easterly member of the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of BC. I think my membership is up to date. I still get, I still get the email announcements, but anyways, I tend not to be able to get many events. But it's also a great privilege for me to be here in Vancouver. This is the city in which I made my adult life, although I was disturbed, my partner and I were disturbed the other day to realize we've lived in Ottawa now longer than we lived in, in Vancouver. And it's such a pleasure to be here uh, in the presence of, of some very old mentors and, and very old friends. So there's a real sense in which I have a feeling of coming home here. And I'm particularly delighted to be giving the inaugural Paul and Eileen Lin lecture. As was noted, uh, I studied under Paul Lin at, at McGill during the early 1970s. And it's largely, I think, because of Paul that I got a chance to go to China as an exchange student in 1976 to 78. And that was something that has changed my life and in many ways made my life. And this kind of possibility was very much the, the kind of thing I think that Paul was about enabling these kinds of connections. There are also some other connections in my own family history back to, uh, back to the Linz. Uh, my mother met Paul in the 19, early 1940s, late 1930s, when her, his brother David was a student at McGill. My mother is a second generation Chinese Canadian, spent all of her life uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Montreal, but she knew the Linz uh, early on uh, and, uh, and so forth. So this is a, another connection that's in a, a great joy to sort of participate in. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, uh, meeting Paul and Eileen Lin in 1977 when they were visiting uh, uh, Beijing. And I was a student, and a bunch of us came down, and we, we met, met them, and I think we all went to, to dinner together. And at the time that I was in Beijing in that period, in ways that are perhaps hard to understand today, China wasn't really part of the world that Canadians lived in. Socially, politically, and even in terms of distance, it was the furthest place in the world, maybe with the possible exception of North Korea, from what the world was here in Canada. In 1976, you couldn't even go there directly from Canada or anywhere else in the Western world. You had to fly to, uh, to Hong Kong via Tokyo, you then took the train to Shenzhen, which was a sleepy little border town with a small border outpost, a little, little fishing village. And you walked across a bridge, a small railroad bridge, into Red China, as they called it. And then after customs processing, you took the train to Guangdong, and then you took the train to Beijing, which was a day and a half. So to get from Montreal to Beijing uh, took, 12, uh, took five days. Today, I can fly from Toronto to Beijing in uh, 13 hours. And it's great, I don't even have to change my watch because it's the same time only half a day ahead. At the time that I was in China, there were hardly any foreigners there. There were about 300 foreign experts, there were diplomats and their families, and then there were about uh, several thousand foreign students, mainly from, uh, from the third world. And uh, outside, there were almost no tourists. Those that were there had to be accompanied by official China Travel Service guides. And outside of Beijing, Shanghai, and Canton, 
uh, foreigners would literally draw crowds of hundreds of people who would follow them around. Uh, China was, in fact, the hidden ki kingdom as mysterious to peoples in the West as it was before the Opium Wars in the 19th century. And it's in this context that Paul Lin did much of his landmark work of actually looking for active ways of explaining China to people in the West. And that's something that, 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 that I appreciated. And part of that explanation was also an effort to understand China from the Chinese point of view, not just from an imposed point of view from outside observers. And I think this is one of the great things that I learned from him. The opening up of China to the world was only beginning when I left in 1978. And in fact, uh, Deng Xiaoping's official rehabilitation was only announced on my way home. Now, I didn't go back to China until 2014, after an absence of 36 years. And what most struck me in China wasn't just the physical transformation of its cities, which is itself remarkable, but the ways in which China is now connected to the rest of the world. For good or for ill, much the same products are available there as are available here. Wang Fujing in Beijing is disturbingly like Times Square in New York. In New York, Hollywood films are shown in Chinese theaters. You can buy the recent issue of Vogue magazine on the newsstands. And through the internet, I can collect, connect directly back to my university and its servers, while newspapers, televisions, and, e and uh, internet news feeds report many of the same kinds of international stories in much the same way that they're shown here. Most of all, people can go in and out of the country in, can, relatively speaking, in un, relatively unhindered ways. And today, foreigners are virtually unnoticed even in the smaller centers. And I even have, for example, the, the card of the Sinhua uh, bureau chief, uh, Ottawa bureau chief in my Rolodex. Actually, I don't have a Rolodex. I have a pile of, 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 of cards. And I regularly communicate with the education de delegation of the Chinese embassy for business reasons. Indeed, tomorrow, I'm flying to Wuhan for two weeks where I'm going to be uh, giving a series of lectures for the Faculty of Education of Central China Normal University. But as much as we're connected to people and things Chinese today, there is still a powerful sense in which China remains the unknown country to people in Canada. And the connections that we live don't translate into the depth of knowledge needed for genuine understanding and to develop common projects around the problems of our time. And it's this connectedness and their effacement in the networks of what I call cultural representations that surround us that I want to talk about today. And what I'm trying to do here is to propose a different way of thinking and doing and studying and writing history. One that isn't read through the frameworks of nationalizing schemas, but instead seeks to connect people to others around them, and indeed to others at some distance removed in time and place through what I call a pedagogy of connection. And in this, we begin with a micro space such as this room and the people and things here at this moment. And we trace outwards and backwards and through time the material embodied and symbolic connections that make this place. And although I'm concerned about this particular present place, we can also do this historically with other times and places. So I'm going to argue that as much as we're connected to other parts of the world materially and through our own embodiment, the cultural landscapes that surround us are marked in labels in ways that only privilege particular versions of histories and in fact, a particular history of dominance. And that actually squashed the representation of the lived connections that we have to people, place, and things in the rest of the world. This is what uh, Nicole Grant, uh, a rather brilliant PhD thesis, uh, PhD student of mine, uh, and I have theorized this, this marking as the wallpaper of dominance. Wallpaper because it's always in the background. It's a pattern that goes unnoticed and continually repeats. But also wallpaper because it actually papers over this dominance and its ongoing creation. And also wallpaper because it um, 
is only evident when it gets torn. And this wallpaper, it seems to me, is what actually enables racist violence and hides the ongoing violence of colonialism because it makes certain kinds of bodies, certain languages, certain cultural systems of representation, certain practices, as somehow part of this place while making other bodies, languages, and practices alien, exotic, things that don't really belong here. All right. So one way of thinking about this is in the, of this wallpaper is in the names that surround us. We live in a world filled with signs, street signs, traffic signs, advertisements, brands, logos, words, uh, apps that work in certain ways. And these times, signs tell us that we're in the city of Vancouver. Right? And Vancouver is an English name. Right? The uh, city of Vancouver was named by Cornelius Van Horn, who was the general manager of the uh, Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, he lived in Montreal. He was an American. Uh, and it was named after Captain George Vancouver, who was a British um, sea captain who, in 1791, uh, sailed into the waters around here and did some mapping expeditions. One way about thinking about this process of naming is as an active expression and ongoing continuation of colonization. Right. There were people here who had been here for thousands of years, who I mentioned in the acknowledgement, who had been here since the beginning of time, who had names for this place. But those names are not ones that are remembered. We might also want to think about what the actual kinds of power that needs to be in place for such naming to take place. This is a power that had been created in the first instance through, uh, through such things as um, uh, military action. Uh, in the 1850s, 1860s, up and down the coast of British Columbia, 1840s, Royal Navy gunboats shelled in villages of uh, First Nations. Um, they, uh, uh, in 1858, they, they put a, a, a gunboat just off the, just offshore from the Musqueam people. And by the end of that summer, the entire lower mainland had been surveyed into 150 acre plots. In fact, gunboats were used against indigenous peoples on this coast as late as, 2000, as 1908. And military action has been used against indigenous people in this country more, most recently, the Gustafson Lake standoff in 1995. And most disturbingly, during the Oka standoff in 1990, when amongst other things, CF-118 fighter jets uh, at 15 minute intervals came over at treetop level over the village of Kanasataki for several days. All right. When we think about this, you know, what kind of power is involved in being able to have a name like this? So just as an experiment, let's decide that instead of having uh, you know, somebody from Montreal name uh, this place and get that name to, to stick, what if we could get something from here to get a different name in Montreal to, to, to stick? So I think we should rename Montreal Timville. It's got a ring to it. I was born there, so, it's, so it fits. But what kinds of things actually have to happen for us to do this? Well, first of all, we need to agree that this is a good thing to do. So I'm going to lock the doors and keep talking until you all agree. <laughs> all right? But assuming we've all agreed to that, you know, what kinds of processes of power need to be at work to create this? Right? So I use this just as one example to sort of uh, to sort of illustrate uh, this kind of colonization that's going on. I'm going to give you a couple of other examples. Um, this place, British Columbia, is uh, named after the Columbia Territory. It was called British to differentiate it from the, 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 the country Columbia being established in South America at the same time. Allegedly, British, uh, Queen Victoria sort of added the British to it. Um, and uh, uh, that itself, by the way, was an imperializing move. To say it was British was to say this was British. Well, in fact, at the time it wasn't British. 
it was the unceded territory of thousands and thousands of indigenous people, people who were the majority of the population of what is now British Columbia until the 1880s, until after the railway is, is, is com was completed. Okay. But the Columbia Territory is named after the Columbia River, which is named after a sailing vessel, the SS Columbia, which was sent out by John Jacob Astor's fur trading company from New England, which is named after Christopher Columbus, this man here. Now, Christopher Columbus is the alleged discoverer of the Americas. Even though at the time he discovered it, two-fifths of the world's population lived here and didn't know they needed to be discovered. But beyond that, he is also personally responsible for the genocide of the Arawak people on the island of Hispaniola. The way he committed this genocide is he gave people, uh, uh, the men, a, a quota of gold they had to bring to him every, every month. And they gave the women a, clo a quota of cloth that they had to, weigh, uh, they had to uh, uh, weave every month to bring to them. And if they didn't succeed in doing this, he cut off their hands. There was no gold on the island of Hispaniola. So every time we name this province, not only are we celebrating British imperialism, we're actually celebrating genocide. So perhaps it's something to change. It would be an interesting discussion to have. The province of Timville, we could talk. <laughs> Stanley, Stanley would be a good, good name for it. Right? Um, this is just, just, just uh, one example, okay? We have an example of, of Siwash Rock, and, I, and I'm pleased to note that the Parks Board has decided to, to uh, try to acknowledge this. There is actually a tiny little, little sign there that talks about the legend uh, that, that went in there. One of the things I invite you to think about is not simply whether we should ha restore the name that was used for millennia to this place, and recognize and honor it. But how is the naming of this one place actually going to be read in relationship to the naming of everything else? Where are the other signs that are in Coast Salish? Where are the multiple names that, that, that can be used? The City of Toronto has actually started a process of as they renew street signs, adding in, uh, depending on where they are in Toronto, the local indigenous language, either I, I imagine as a transliteration or a direct translation of the name of the street sign. This is a way of remarking a territory to acknowledge the fact that there are people here who have been here since the beginning of time. So it's not just a question of sort of naming and renaming particular things. It's actually about looking at a whole network of, of naming and, and processes of, of uh, creation. Now, for a long time, I've been critical of nationalist approaches to the past. And histories tend to be told from the point of view of particular national communities and actors. May meanwhile, we tend to study and teach it along national lines. So people are historians of 19th century China or 20th century France. And the problem here, as I've argued in other places, is that the histories, at least in Canadian contexts, cannot account for the racisms and, and colonial violences that have made and continue to make this place called Canada. While as the new Canada Hall, the Canadian Museum of History shows, it's possible to make a more inclusive history to represent, for example, indigenous peoples as actors throughout Canadian history or to acknowledge that what the museum itself would call the two sides of John A. Macdonald, his role as nation maker and his white supremacy and genocide of indigenous peoples. This history still denies both the effects of racism and colonialism in not just making injustice, but in creating dominance. And dominance being created in relationship to the subjugation of people in ways that continue into the present. It also erases the connected ways that human beings have actually lived in this territory to people across boundaries, political and national boundaries, and politically organized boundaries to people elsewhere. This includes, for example, the way John and McDonald's built, uh, own activities of nation building were part and parcel 
of a larger project of British imperialism through which people from Britain created the largest empire in the history of the world at that time. Right. And this, by the way, is something that he would have celebrated. MacDonald is actually probably the most successful agent of British imperialism in the 19th century. When he purchases the Hudson's Bay Company lands, which were then indigenous territories, this is the largest land grab in the history of the British Empire. So we don't think of him as an agent of colonialism and imperialism, whereas he bragged about it. All right. So Canada is, in fact, a local project of, 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 of a much larger imperialism that, for example, also affected China. We see it in the Opium Wars. We see it in the, in the unequal treaties. In fact, the whole history of China during the 19th and, and 20th centuries uh, up until 1949 was one about uh, different imperialist powers trying to take over. These networks, by the way, that I'm talking about, that transnational networks or go across different boundaries, is not new. I live within a few kilometers of Chaudière Falls and the place on the Gatineau River where the Ottawa, Rideau, and uh, Gatineau Rivers meet. And for thousands of years, this area was the meeting place for the indigenous peoples throughout North northeastern North America. People as far south as Virginia, as far west as the Mississippi, as far north as Labrador would convene there in order to trade, in order to work deals, in order to uh, exchange experiences. So, um, so one of the things that I've sort of been trying to play with here is to um, is to find a way out of what I'm seeing increasing as a kind of dilemma. So a lot of my research has been about, if I can find a way of talking about histories that acknowledge racism and colonialism, that this could be an important way of promoting anti-racism education. I've recently come to rethink this because I'm not entirely sure that such a history will actually change those who are themselves hold, for want of a better word, deeply racist attitudes. So I'll give you an example. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, a woman asked the newly elected NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, whether he was going to impose Sharia law. Now, would it have been helpful to explain to this woman that Mr. Singh is in fact not Muslim, but a Sikh? Or that Sharia, in fact, is not just about cutting off people's hands, uh, and, or for that matter, that there are not that many Muslims in Canada in the first place to be able to impose much of anything, or even that the ones who are here actually have no interest in proposing Sharia law uh, for the most part because the main reason they're here is they have much the same values as everybody else. I don't think so. That wouldn't have changed this woman's mind. This, her position is actually not about misinformation. All right. Recently, the Australian cultural anthropologist Ghassan Hajj has noted what he calls the failure of anti-racism. He argues that anti-racists have approached combating racism much the way that we do in academic debate, correcting mistaken premises, providing more secure knowledge. We fail generally to address the underlying affects that make it believable that Mr. Singh is a cover for the Islamicization of Canada. And that allows people to sort of read people against the landscape, this wallpaper of dominance, as not belonging here, even when they have been here longer than anyone else. So I'll give you an example. Some years ago in past life, I was teaching at UBC, and one of my students was a member of the Muslim First Nation, and she was telling me a story that had happened to her as she was waiting for the bus just outside the reserve. Uh, she was there with her daughter who was seven or eight and who was a bit rambunctious because the bus was taken, so the kid was jumping up and down. And there was an older European woman who was a bit irritated by this. And as this, this student of mine and her daughter got on the bus, she turned to them and said, why don't you go back to where you came from? <laughs> where, where, does, where does she begin to say, hello, excuse me? <laughs> This is where I came from. I don't know where you came from. <laughs> but you know, this, this is where it's not just about mistaken information. 
And here I think it's really important or useful to remember Hannah Arendt's conclusion about the social basis of totalitarianism. Hannah Arendt was a political philosopher. She's my favorite um, political philosopher. But her landmark study, The Origins of Totalitarianism, she not only invented the term totalitarianism, she asked what made it all possible. What allowed the perpetrators of the Holocaust, for example, to work a nine to five shift and go home to their families? Right? What enabled Stalin's purges and, uh, uh, and imposed famines that led to the, the murder of millions, all in the name of building socialism? And her conclusion is at once brilliant and devastating. She said that the social basis of totalitarianism was not the ruthlessness of the totalitarian program, wasn't the organization of the totalitarian party that permeated all aspects of life. She said rather it was the most common and most radical of human experiences, loneliness. The totalitarian program was to sever the ordinary links that bind people together what she called the common sense that arises uh, from the fact that more than one human being lives in the world. A sense that arises from our daily interactions and bumping into people that uh, blunts the sharpness of our ideas as we rub together. Instead, the lonely man, as she called them in the sexist idiom of her time, could follow the logic of an idea to the point where it defied uh, its ultimate conclusion, the point where it defied common sense that we gain from living together in a common world. Nationalist histories, it seems to me, of any kind, can't create the connections that counter this kind of loneliness. Because ultimately the goal of every nationalism is to create an, an us and a them, and if need be, to mobilize the us to murder the them. And instead, I think we need to find a different way of binding us together, an approach to history that connects people together in ways that would cement us, that doesn't allow a space to be created for racisms to enter in. And it doesn't allow a space to be created for colonialism to be engaged in without actually having to engage with the direct human consequences of it. And understanding the microspaces we inhabit through pedagogy of connection across time, place, and difference, I think, does this. Uh, and the challenge is that the wallpaper of dominance papers over our uh, materially embodied and symbolic connections in ways that we don't recognize. So what I'm talking about in my pedagogy of, of connectedness, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an education professor, so I have to talk about pedagogy at some point. Otherwise, I lose my membership card. Um, but um, uh, so we start with microspaces and move outwards. And the first thing we ask is how the space gets to be created materially as a material space. So how did the things in this room get to be here? The chairs, the drywall, you know, the the, the projector, you know, the clothes we're wearing, our glasses. How did they come to be here? But secondly, how does the space get symbolically represented, right? What kinds of sign systems, what languages dominate in this space? As I look around this room, I see some Chinese on a poster, right? But I notice the stuff on the walls are in Roman numeral, Roman letters, you know, places that originate on the other side of the world. And the language I'm speaking also originates on, this, on the other side of the world. And the third element is how the space comes to be embodied. So how did we ourselves get to be here? But also, how do we see each other in terms of the different categories that we enact and create, you know, as gender, uh, sexuality, age, professorialness, etc. So let me uh, illustrate what I mean. So take a moment, look around the room, take stock of everything. Right? Everything we see has been made by human beings. Today in the world, even wilderness is made by human beings by the active decision not to develop it. The natural things we see, not in this room, but outside of this room, like the sky and the clouds and the stars, only have meaning to our, for us because human beings have also enacted upon them. They've named them. They've created 
explanations for what they are and what they do. So the words, the languages we use were made by human beings, even as we make them again ourselves anew. There's something magic going on here. We're actually surrounded by ghosts. Ghosts not of the ectoplasmic kind, but the unseen human hearts, hands, and minds that have made our world and everything in it, including we ourselves. And if we can trace that making, we actually connect ourselves to the hundreds, uh, the hundred, over 100 billion human beings who have lived. In theory, we can connect ourselves back to the very first human beings to come out of the trees. So let me give you an example of the kind of connection I mean. How many of you have cell phones? So most of you do. Those of you who don't, I congratulate you. There's hope for the world. I have a, my cell phone's in my junk. Okay. Well, as it turns out, 70% of the world's cell phones are assembled in a single factory in Shenzhen. This is the Apple part, by the way. Okay. Okay. So this means that if you have a cell phone, the odds are, whether you know it or not, you're connected to thousands of Chinese workers and through them to their families and communities in China just by the material object in your pocket. But it's actually more complicated than that. The cell phone was designed in California. The rare earths that make the screen come from Africa. The software engineering was done in India, let alone all the apps that come from all over the place. So in fact, you have a device in your pocket that connects you to the world. And today, for the first time, you have a device in your project that connects you to the world in a way never before possible. Today, there are four billion users of the internet. And through your cell phone, you can directly communicate, at least in theory, with every single one of them. This enables the possibility of a vast human conversation uh, for, the very, uh, for the very first time. Now, you might think this is all very fine, this is all very good, interesting idea. But you know, we're thinking history here. So the history of Shenzhen and that factory and the history of us here in Vancouver, those aren't connected. All right? So let me prove to you, in fact, that this is not so. All right? And that's because that factory in Shenzhen is directly connected to what I've argued is the most important event ever, political event ever to have taken place in Canada, which took place in Victoria, BC in 1899. Uh, Vancouver plays a role. As you may know, uh, at the time British Columbia entered Confederation, this was an indigenous territory in which there were only a few thousand non-indigenous peoples. And by the way, as, uh, it's quite likely, uh, increasingly, uh, as, as uh, scholars, uh, particularly scholars of Chinese history, have looked at this, um, of those non-indigenous people, it's very likely the majority were Chinese. All right. Certainly, the historical geographers Cole Harris and Bob Galwa have argued uh, that the Chinese were as significant a group as were uh, the Europeans and the, Euro uh, the European colonizers and as the indigenous peoples. From the moment of their arrival to China in this territory and during the 1858 gold rush, Chinese people participated in the civic life of the emerging community, voting in elections, participating in things like the subscription campaign to build a hospital in Victoria. They cleared the land, built the roads, um, built the dikes, mined for gold, and traded it with First Nations people. Despite this or because of it, the third act of the British Columbia legislature banned so-called Chinamen along with First Nations people, from voting. By the late 1890s, disenfranchisement had made other invidious policies possible against people of Chinese origins. Other legislation banned them from the federal vote. The immigrant workers and their family members had to pay the head tax. People of Chinese origins were largely ghettoized in Chinatowns. Uh, and uh, uh, ultimately, over close to 200 provincial pieces of legislation barred them from such things as working for the government on crown timber licenses, on contracts for the government, uh, while popular violence closed many parts of the territory of British Columbia to them as well. Now, in the face of this, Chinese people fought back. 
They organize mutual aid associations. They use the courts to fight for their rights, sometimes successfully. And they organize politically, for example, by forming the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, what the historical geographer David Lai has characterized as a Chinese government in Canada. But still, exclusion and violence persisted. Important to know that these people from China were connected to people and things in China much the way that people from Europe were connected to people and things from Europe. Letters home, newspapers uh, later on, news magazines, uh, and, and so forth. So particularly the educated amongst them, who were mainly the merchants, were well aware of such things as the self-strengthening movement that had started in China during the Taiping uh, Revolution and through which China was seeking to gain the wealth and power of the West so it could re reassert itself and return to its rightful place in the world in the face of the foreign powers. Thus, in 1898, when news reached people here of the 100 Days Reform, uh, they were hopeful that a strong China would mean they would no longer be oppressed in British Columbia. So the 100 Days Reform was has been described as an effort to create a constitutional monarchy in China, certainly a, a, a vast reform movement. However, the reform ended when the Empress Dowager Zixi uh, staged a palace coup, imprisoned her nephew, the Kangxi Emperor, on a small little stone boat in the uh, Summer Palace, and ordered the execution of the leading uh, uh, reformers. Now, it so happened that the main instigator of the form, Kang Youwei, uh, somebody who was from Guangdong province, by the way, was able to flee the country first to Japan, and then in the midst of rumors of assassins personally dispatched by the Empress Dowager to get him, he arrived in Victoria, BC. And this is where this man, this is the Vancouver connection comes in. This is Yip Song. Yip Song was uh, uh, the wealthiest Chinese merchant, probably one of the wealthiest people in British Columbia during this era. He had, by the way, four wives, 23 children, had, had something like, you know, there's certainly like something like 2,000 Yip Song descendants in the country. Uh, a, a friend of mine in Ottawa, Robert Yips, his grandson. So like, there's a lot of Yips around. So this is where all the Yips come from. Uh, but he had, he had worked on the railway, he had worked for a labor contractor, he had helped, uh, he was fluent in English. Uh, he was a fairly influential man. Kong Yue sent his nephew, Yip An, to Victoria to meet Kong Yue. And, and there, uh, in, 1890, in 1899, Kong Yue Wei, with the leading Chinese merchants of British Columbia, formed the Bao Huang Hui or Chinese Empire Reform Association. This is the first modern political party in Chinese history. By 1903, it had a worldwide membership of 500 people, of 500,000 people. It organizes the way systems of organizing, fundraising, and making revolution, uh, later employed by Sun Yat-sen and his Revolutionary Party, which led directly to the Chinese Nationalist Revolution. As the first Chinese political party, the Bao Huang Hui is the direct precursor to the Chinese Communist Party, an organization today that has 90 million people, and which has been pursuing the same policies of self-strengthening that made the special economic zone in Shenzhen that brought you that factory that brought you the cell phone in your pocket. So this is just one example of the kinds of material connections we can think about. All right? Every single thing in this room can be looked on as a kind of a, 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 a web link that you could click on and we could unearth its history that connects us to other people elsewhere in the world across time and place. And to, all, and to ways of also knowledge making. You know? Part of what makes this cell phone possible is a binary code of zeros and ones. Well, zero is not a European invention. It was invented in, in ancient India. Comes to Europe through the Arabs. The numbers we use are Arabic letters. All right? The ancient Romans couldn't do long division by nines because they didn't have this idea of a placeholder who made nothing for nothings. The Mayans independently also came up with the idea of zero. <coughs> 
If it wasn't for that connection, we wouldn't have cell phones. Because <laughs> you don't get binary codes unless there's an off, something that stands for nothing. All right? So this is not just about material things, it's about knowledge. The, road, the, the pathway here, the steps outside lead to roads that connect to every roadway in the Americas. Just, just think about that. Whereas the stuff we drink, the coffee we drink, the clothes we wear, the foods we eat, connect us again backwards through time to other people and other places all right, around the world. All right. So part, of, so, that, so part of this thing is about building connections materially. The other part is about uh, building uh, connections by looking at the sign systems, how the world, if you want, is labeled, how it gets relabeled by words, by representations that make meaning. And it's here we find what, I'm gonna, what, what uh, our British scholar Nuro Poor calls cognitive dissonance. Because what happens is, because, these, because our spaces get marked by certain systems, um, we then don't actually see, um, uh, we then tend to see, read people as somehow belonging in relationship to this marking and other people who don't. So, for example, the language that I'm speaking is read as the language that naturally belongs here. It's the language we're all speaking. It's interesting that I'm not speaking Coast Salish. It's interesting that the Vancouver Public Library didn't see fit to translate this simultaneously into Coast Salish. All right. It's interesting that when people see those Chinese characters on the poster, in this place that we inhabit, people tend to see a foreign language. It's taught in universe. Chinese is taught in foreign language departments, by the way, folks, or modern language departments. English and, English and French aren't modern languages. They're just departments. But, you know, those, those other people's languages, right? Yet Chinese characters have been in this territory continuously since 1858, as long as English has been in this particular part of British Columbia. Why is it read as foreign and English is not? Furthermore, the dominance of English wasn't just uh, something that happened because people came from England and then magically brought with them their languages. It's not that simple. English was made to be dominant. It was made to be dominant first and foremost through the process of colonization that made this territory part of the British Empire. A process of colonization that was continued uh, by, the, uh, by, the, um, uh, by, by Canada uh, following confederation of this territory in 1871. Part and parcel of that was to actually not just marginalized, but to destroy the languages of the people who spoke here through active processes of genocide. Right. And then all this gets finally cemented through the wonderful project of government-controlled schooling. Right. Government-controlled schooling is made compulsory in the city of, of, of Vancouver in uh, around 1901. Uh, it's made compulsory elsewhere in British Columbia in 1920, as is compulsory edu as is, is also made throughout Canada for so-called status Indians in 1920. All right. This is most evident in the residential schools, residential schools in which uh, 150,000 uh, First Nations and Inuit and Métis children were uh, forcibly combined, uh, often using, by the way, the police to actually bring them there. Uh, where their parents were, uh, were barred from having any communications with them, and where the children were beaten for speaking their own languages. Literally had their knowledge of their own languages beaten out of them so that they could speak English. The day schools that were more common for First Nations children did similar things in only slightly less violent ways. All right? But provincial public schools also did the same thing. One of the things that's going on here in, in, in terms of this is actually forcing people to learn English and then it becomes a way in which you create this idea that there's non-English speakers and English speakers in ways that actually has nothing to do with what languages they actually speak. 
And we see this in the case of 1922-23 in the Victoria Chinese student strike. When uh, in 1922, the, Vic the Victoria School Board decided to extend a partial system of segregation that applied to recently arrived students from China who did not speak English, what we might today call ESL intensive classes, and they applied it to all children uh, who are of Chinese racial origins, regardless of what language they spoke. As the Chinese noted at the time when the school board said it was because you don't speak English. Well, actually, we're speaking to you in English now, folks. <laughs> Right? But they also notice, well, there's other people, there's other foreigners in, in Victoria who don't speak English, but they're not being sent to these schools. It's only Chinese people do. And the Chinese community in Victoria responded by organizing a student strike that lasted for a year. During the strike, they did things like build their own schools, where, by the way, they spoke, they taught English and Chinese, right? until finally they forced the school board to at least partially. Uh, back then, right? So part of the reason that schools today in, in Canada are not racially segregated, at least the same way they used to be, is because people such as the Chinese communities resisted that and fought for their integration. So part of this process of creating dominance of English and English languages and English forms uh, was resisted, but it was also very much a way of sort of marking certain things that somehow naturally here. All right. Next element is, is what I call the process of embodiment. How each of us actually come to be here in this particular space. But how our bodies get made here? And certain kinds of bodies. So, you know, we read each other in terms of this whole cultural repertoire of gender, of sexualities, of age. Uh, maybe we can infer social class from how people dress. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a whole sort of stuff that goes on that's actually fairly unconscious, but that we read all the time. Every one of those categories is also created and also enacted, has also been created by human beings. And they, do to themselves, become categories through which dominance is created. So one of the things happens in this space where English is the thing that dominates, where European cultural forms become taken as the norms, is that those bodies that aren't read as somehow of European origin, somehow English, exist in this space on at least a contingent basis. Either they're read as somehow not belonging here at all, or people have to explain that they belong here. So people of color in Canada, uh, I've heard African Canadians talk about this uh, today. Uh, today at dinner, we were talking about this for, for, for Chinese Canadians. One of the common things that happens is people say, where are you from? Somehow when you answer Burnaby, that's not really what they want to know. Where, where are you really from? Well, I'm from Burnaby. No, no, you know what I mean. Uh, and it's like, well, okay, well, wh where are your people from? Oh, well, my parents came from Calgary. <laughs> you know, th th this, 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 is, this, is, this is not what happens. I never get asked that, because people read me as a white person. I have never been asked where I'm from. People assume I'm from here. People assume I belong here. And that's because there's a cultural landscape that reinforces this message in myriad ways through that wallpaper of dominance, that pattern. And so this is part of the processes of, of cognitive dissonance and cognitive cons uh, uh, consonance that sort of somehow seems to naturalize the presence of certain kinds of people and bodies while rendering other ones who are as much or have been longer in this place than anyone else are read as somehow not belonging. And I think this is the kind of thing that uh, we need to think about in reimagining uh, a, new, a new form of history. Now, there's one thing that's going on here that's actually very much taken for granted in everything that we do, that's so much a part of the world that we inhabit, we actually don't think about it. Although it's interesting, you do actually have to teach children what this is and how it works. A great deal of effort in schooling is actually devoted to teaching children about this. And this is the idea of property and private property. 
So everything that's in this room is property. Right? Some of it might be property of the library. Some of it might be your personal property. We even see our bodies in terms of property. Right? And often violence is enacted against people when it's assumed that someone else's body is their property and they can do with it what they want, as we see, for example, in sexual violence. Right? So, this met, so, so property as a reality is very much a part of this society we live in. But this too was something that was invented and that was made to be here through a history of dominance. One that actually combines all three things, the material, the symbolic, and the embodied. I'll just give you part of this. So part of it has to do with this man who is one of my favorite people, John D. McDonald. You know, we, we live in a country where uh, John D. McDonald gets to be celebrated on all sorts of things. When we had $1 bills, he was on the $1 bill, if you remember that. Um, uh, we have McDonald monuments everywhere. We have McDonald schools. By the way, the Vancouver School McDonald School is not by John Alec McDonald. It's by William. It's William McDonald, so it's not the same McDonald. But there are other McDonald schools elsewhere. Um, in, uh, in Ottawa recently, they renamed the Ottawa River Va uh, Parkway the John A. McDonald Parkway, uh, which I protested. And the reason I protested is because my, my McDonald is, in some ways, a very interesting character. I probably actually, of Canadian Prime Ministers, he'd be an interesting guy to have dinner with. Um, by the way, he's, he, wasn't, he had been an alcoholic, but he actually was a reformed alcoholic later in life. So, so he's unfairly represented as being drunk all the time. Not being, I want to I give a balanced account here. <laughs> okay? But, you know, we remember MacDonald as the Prime Minister of, first Prime Minister of Canada. This is not true. The first Prime Minister was, was Mackenzie King. Uh, this was until the Statutes of Westminster, uh, when Canada became truly independent. Before then, the Prime Minister was the, there was only one Prime Minister, and that was the head of the United Kingdom government. So he was the Premier of Canada. He was, also wasn't the first head of a government called Canada. That, that distinction belongs to Hippolyte Lafontaine, who was... Uh, the head, the premier of the province of Canada when it was created in 1840. But leaving that aside, this is just picky historical stuff. Right? We remember him as the father of Canada, which always makes me wonder, who was the mother? You know? um, uh, in fact, his role in confederation is not what it's often led out to be. Uh, apparently he was quite drunk when the deal was worked out at the Quebec conference in 1866. And when he went to London in 1867, he actually argued vociferously against the federal structure. He wanted a unitary state. But in fairness, he does become the first head of government. He's the one who makes the federal system work. Okay. But MacDonald uh, is also um, has a different side to him. Right. And part of this has to do with his whole project was about creating a, and colonizing what is now Canada, the territory now Canada, which involved taking the property and territories of indigenous peoples and converting it to the private property of people like himself. That was fundamentally what he was about, and he wouldn't have apologized for this. And we see this quite actively in 1885 uh, in the uh, uh, creation of the uh, piece of legislation that he called his greatest triumph. This is the Electoral Franchise Act. 1885, he's, uh, he's creating a federal voting system that was supposed to ensure Tory rule forever because he, through a series of patronage appointments, he would control the electoral machine. What MacDonald did, though, is he based his property, his qualification to vote on ownership of property. You had to own or rent property of a certain value. Initially, he proposed giving the vote to women who met the property qualification, but when other men in the House of Commons said very clearly they could support that, he dropped that. Right? He also proposed giving it to so-called Indians if they met the property qualification, because he knew some people in Ontario who owned enough property who were, quote, civilized. Uh, he defined civilized, by the way, as owning property paying taxes and sending your children to school, and these people did all these three things. Uh, he also proposed giving them the right to vote, uh, even though in their private letters to him they told him they didn't want the right to vote because they were sovereign people, 
and didn't need to vote in the Canadian system. Right. And then he added just one more small detail. He had a small problem. Probably the largest group of property owners, or amongst the largest groups of property owners in British Columbia, were the Chinese. Right. The whole point of British imperialism wasn't to create a system of private property and then have the Chinese own it. It was to have the British own it. All right. So in the legislation, he added a defining clause. The defining clause that defined a person as a male person, including an Indian, and excluding a Chinaman. When a member of the opposition asked, well, are people from Hong Kong Chinamen? Because they're British subjects. He thanked the member, and he changed it to read, and excluding a person of Mongolian or Chinese race. This is the first time, to my knowledge, in the history of the British Empire that race biologically defined is used to determine political rights. Uh, MacDonald, uh, 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 when he did this, was immediately challenged by everybody in saying, how could you do this? this is an invidious distinction. The opposition voted in, were, were outraged because the Chinese are respon were re uh, respectable people. The Senate actually debated whether they could send the legislation back because of the legislation. But what he explained was that he was concerned that the Chinese would control the vote, and they would impose, as he said, Chinese values, Asiatic principles, Asiatic uh, uh, feelings on this house and its people. When he was further pressed by the opposition, he said, the Chinese shouldn't have the vote. They need to be excluded because the cross of the Caucasian with the Asiatic is like the cross of the dog and the fox, and it can't be sustained. In other words, they're separate species. Right. And he said, if we allowed the Chinese in, we would have a mongrel race, and what he char characterized as, quote, the Aryan nature of the future of British North America would be endangered. He's the only person who uses this language in this period. So he's inventing not just white suprem not just a racist exclusion, he's inventing a political system of white supremacy. That's calling us his greatest achievement. Right? Now the next piece of legislation is the Chinese Immigration Act. In explaining the Chinese Immigration Act, his Quebec Lieutenant, Joseph Adolf Chaplow, who is also a Royal Commissioner on Chinese Immigration, says the real reason for this is uh, because of property because people in British Columbia, uh, leaders in British Columbia say, we want to be here ourselves and we don't want others to be here. So creating this system of private property that we now take for granted is very much linked to the colonization of this territory, the conversion of the territories of indigenous peoples to private property, which also directly links to the exclusions of Asians and other racialized minorities. It's the same project. So another thing that's, that's uh, going on here, a couple of things to think about. Uh, a, a book that I re read recently, which is even more disturbing than Hannah Arendt's, is uh, a book by Tim Snyder called Black Earth, the Holocaust as History and Warning. And Snyder actually in this sort of uh, re-examines the whole history of the Holocaust using uh, the primary sources and secondary sources of 12 different European languages. He's a rather disgusting person who just seems to speak every language there is in the world. And in so doing, he undoes everything I thought I knew about the Holocaust. It was not done by Nazi indoctrinated ideology. It was done by ordinary people. The first, the Holocaust begins when a reserve police unit in Bremen uh, murders uh, 300,000 Jews at Baba Yar outside of Kiev. And they did this, and then they went back, uh, when the rotation was up, they went back to Bremen to issue parking tickets. And they wrote letters home explaining, justifying this, as it was kinder for the Jews to murder them than to let them slowly starve to death, apparently not noticing that the Nazi policies were causing them to starve. But uh, Schneider argues that underlying the Holocaust was actually a vast transfer of Jewish property to others. And this is what made it a popular movement. 
And he further argues this is the basis of every genocide, is this transfer of property. The logic goes, first you create a, another, an other, then it's like, why are they different from us? But then why should they have so much when we have so little? Then what you do is you say, well, let's take their stuff over. So now we have it. Okay, well, we need to just put them over here in the corner. Well, that's too close. Well, let's move them, ship them out somewhere else. How do we make sure they don't come back? You kill them. This program was done in parts to Japanese Canadians on this territory who lost their property during the internment, right? It's continuing to be done to indigenous peoples in this, in this country. And the kind of panic that exists over all those Chinese buyers setting up, uh, setting up housing prices is fundamentally one about who controls property. So this is something that we might to think about. How do we create connections that engage with this kind of history and exclusion and that make uh, such things impossible? Of course, the histories that I've been recounting here is not as straightforward as I let on. White supremacy and colonization don't emerge all at once on this territory.